it's definitely a political game that's being played. Who the target is and who the beneficiary is, we still don't know. Uh, the uniform code there, uh, the uniform code did not have hijab as a part of it. Later, some underage women were used, as you said, cannon fodder uh, to sport a hijab in the month of December just to create tensions. They were then yeah. even given the option of coming online and attending classes and they refused. They decided to sit inside the premises of the college and continue with their agenda. Uh, clearly brainwashed, they are 14, 15 year old girls, you can see from the images. What I've heard from the people there is that the same girls came to the, you know, came to school without hijab. Um, and all of this trend started only weeks ago that they suddenly wanted to wear the hijab. And it was never a question before that. So why did this sudden change occur? This is nothing but a very calculative move, a very planned activity. It is not just because of uh, the elections. Islam is a political ideology. It has never been a uh, spiritual religion. From the very beginnings, uh, it wanted to conquer the lands and then implement its uh, political agenda. So whenever you whenever you start uh, anywhere, you have to uh, from a from your humble beginnings, you have to play victim card. You have to play uh, take the sympathies of the people. The idea of suddenly propping up these Dean girls, you know, the faithful girls, so-called faithful girls, is nothing but portraying victimism, evoking emotions of certain community members, and then using it to defame our nation. The Sunni community in India is double victimized. Okay. Uh, one is that they're exploited by their leaders on the one hand for this kind of thing. And then the so-called secular parties victimize them again because they've been thrown to the wolves with absolutely no ability to come out of it. You know, the first question I would like to ask you is... Um, You've already alluded to what is sort of happening um, in Udupi and Kundapura and the entire, entire coastal Karnataka belt. The hijab rav seems to follow a pattern of events which we have quite, uh, we have become accustomed to. This involved manipulated staged setups, even whether it's a Shaheen Bag or Linchistan or intolerance or other such media events which we are then used to seeing this old narratives being projected time and again for the same old reasons. To set the scene for this particular discussion, what are your opening thoughts on this, Abhijitji? Look, there is such a thing as a right to uh, choose what clothes you wear. Okay, we all accept this. The point is, you joined a school where you knew what the dress code was. Okay, it very clearly specifies a scarf uh, on the head. So there is a provision for Muslim students to cover their heads. Uh, a scarf on the head uh, in the same color as the dupatta. Now, if you looked at what those ladies were trying to wear inside, it wasn't merely a scarf on the head. It was a full-blown uh, uh, a violation of the dress code. Because you have seen the other students, we know what the dress code is because you've seen all the Hindu students, the boys and the girls who decide to go in with saffron scarves, they've been wearing white all out. Now, where is the uh, uh, adherence to uniform rules? Why is it called a uniform? Okay. Right. Now, all of this keeps coming up over and over and over again because, you know, uh, the, uh, the definition of a third world country is extremely low human capital and extremely low capacity to explain things. The second problem here is even in our confused state of being a low human capital country, we don't understand what Panth Nirpeksha Dharma Nirpeksha is on the one hand and how to apply it and how it's very different from French laicite on the other hand. Okay, so all of these are issues that we need to be going into uh, and seeing what suits us. But understand this, here it comes down to, yes, the freedom to wear what you want, but in a school 
which has the right to apply its own uh, standards of dress. Thank you for that. Um, Khalid ji, if I may ask you one question, as a human rights lawyer and an activist uh, who was born and brought up in Pakistan and somebody who, if I may add, has a very scholarly interest in religion, history and current affairs for that matter, could you please explain to our audience why Islamists always align with political interests to project such uh, victimhood narratives about themselves and portray others as uh, quote unquote intolerant? Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, the reason is uh, Islam is a political ideology. It has never been a uh, spiritual rel religion. From the very beginnings, uh, it wanted to conquer the lands and then implement its uh, political agenda. So whenever you whenever you start uh, anywhere, you have to uh, from a from your humble beginnings, you have to play victim card. You have to play uh, take the sympathies of the people uh, who are in majority or who who are in power. So you have to wait till the time that you are in a kind of a majority where your nuisance value increases. So this is, this is something we have seen happening everywhere actually. And when you, when you increase your number to a, to a sizable population, which is uh, indoctrinated to be militant and to be, to be uh, aggressive, then uh, um, there is a, all the likelihood that you will come over, uh, you know, the the peaceful, even the peaceful majority, because they are not inclined to fight you uh, uh, the way the way you want to. So this right. is this is basically a, a repeat of the strategy, which has uh, actually uh, uh, proved successful as well, um, thousands of years now. Thank you so much for your opening comments, Khalid ji. Uh, before we delve into this any further, I would like to ask uh, Rashmi ji, there are many reasons attributed to the real intent of these protests, um, if we are following this very closely. Now, you're also from Udupi, uh, so you do have a better and a ground understanding of what is exactly happening. What do your local sources have to say about the real intent about this? Who is behind this? Because it looks like someone is employing these girls as cannon fodder to further their political agenda? Well, um, I think it's a very important question because what I've heard from the people there is that the same girls came to the, you know, came to school without hijab. Um, and all of this trend started only weeks ago that they suddenly wanted to wear the hijab. And it was never a question before that. So why did this sudden change occur? And it's not just that there are six uh, girls, you know, Muslim girls in the college. There are more girls who belong to that religion. But they've never had this issue whatsoever. They, they were all adherent to the uh, dress code that the college prescribed. So it seems like it's a very recent um, problem that has come up. And I've also heard that it's... Uh, the timing is quite, um, you know, it, it's quite convenient with the election of, I think, members of the Muslim community to, to local wards. I've heard that something along these lines happened recently, and this is something that has happened immediately after. So it seems like something, you know, something that education, I think, is something which is very pious, and it's, it's something the sanctity shouldn't be right. muddied by these communal colors, but um, some political elements have found their way onto campus and um, just because they got onto some position in the ward they are now trying to insinuate young girls to kind of put their entire life on the line to you know to, to go on in, in this direction and these are the girls who have their pictures up on social media without a hijab so it's it's never been a question of rights I feel it's it's just a sort of it's just become a you know, it's just become a, a way to st create instability and problem um, among people of different communities and to, to sort of establish that difference in an otherwise peaceful, you know, ecosystem. So this seems right. more like that from a ground perspective. Thank you so much for those points. Uh, very well noted. 
Ashwarya ji, can you give us a legal opinion on this matter? Because right now, um, I believe that this matter is also uh, going to be taken to the court very soon and a committee has been formed uh, if, uh, we were, if the reports are to be true. Do these young women, uh, you know, as an advocate, do you believe that they have a right to wear what they want to, especially in an educational institute? And that is the context here today. I think we need to take a step back and uh, really look at what right to religion is. As in, we have seen it across the Instagram, social media, right to religion. Article 25 gives me right to religion. And uh, when you actually read Article 25, of the constitution, you find out that, let me just read article 25 very quickly. What it really says is subject to public order, morality and health and the other fundamental rights that are contained in this part. So subject to all the other fundamental rights contained in the constitution, a person is entitled to blah, 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 the right to freely profess and practice religion. So it's very clear that the right to having public order, morality and health is given a higher priority than right to religion. And this is not, uh, you don't have to quote me, you know, this is the constitution, a social contract that we have given as people of India, the constitution says this. It's very unfortunate that when the people who sort of repose their complete faith in the constitution and say, oh, this is, uh, this law is draconian, this law is against the constitution. What are you really saying? Because read the constitution. Uh, when a law and order situation was created in that government PU college, which I understand uh, the uniform code there, uh, the uniform code did not have hijab as a part of it. Later, some underage women were used, as you said, cannon fodder uh, to sport a hijab in the month of December, just to create tensions. They were then even given the option of coming online and attending classes and they refused. They decided to sit inside the premises of the college and continue with their agenda. Uh, clearly brainwashed, they are 14, 15 year old girls, you can see from the images. Uh, and this created a law and order situation there. When something like this happens, the government is completely in its right to pass an order saying nothing, not even a, uh, a saffron rope and not even a hijab should be worn. And this will definitely pass the test of constitutionality. Right. And now that they have gone to uh, the Supreme Court, I mean, gone to the High Court with a case, uh, there are ample sort of uh, judgments and precedents which tell us that uh, if a religious practice is coming in the way of law and order, it can be proscribed. And, and let me tell you one thing, this India is not the first country to do this. Iran, a Muslim country, nowhere secular. Iran did this in 2017. During the month of Ramzan, they uh, banned uh, wearing of niqab and burqa because there was a threat from ISIS. And many Muslim countries don't mandate the hijab. For example, Saudi Arabia, so I'll just finish this point, Saudi Arabia, actually recommends wearing of the um, abaya, uh, which is not covering the head. Uh, so when men, and I'm sure uh, Umar ji will sort of throw light on this. Uh, when uh, Nikab, uh, what about our very own Bangladesh's prime minister? She does not wear a hijab. So a devout practicing Muslim need not wear, wear a hijab. And this is accepted by the Muslim world. When such is a situation, I don't understand from where they're coming from and why they're saying that their freedom of, uh, that the constitution is not being followed because the constitution is very clear on that point. Right. One, one point I want to add here before I finish, uh, many might think that is this only the religion which has to sort of uh, suffer the consequences of article 25 and that's not the case. Uh, Tandav, a simple dance form, a very popular dance form or in India that was banned in 2004 uh, because it created a public order situation in Kolkata. And uh, did any of the so-called uh, liberal rights seeking people come out and protest that? I don't think so. 
Right. Sorry. So I must have taken too much time. Carry on, Shah. No, no, it's 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 ab absolutely. You bring up very important points uh, because first of all, you mentioned that these protests, by its nature, cause a disruption to law and order, which are quite evident and also are unconstitutional. Um, so this will not hold up in court is what you're trying to say. Uh, points very well noted. Uh, Jerome Ji, you, you know, now that this has taken a very communal color, many Indians um, have either studied or continue to study in a lot of uh, Catholic institutions, missionary institutions uh, for that matter. And even today, they're some of the best institutions uh, in the country uh, one can accept. Um, for our viewers who may not be aware, uh, you know, can you familiarize uh, us with the with the environment that these schools and colleges have, uh, especially because a particular community, a particular faith is being targeted, saying that the educational institution, because of its um, uh, political and religious biases, is being biased against the other community. Sharanji, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me on your program. Uh, before I answer this, this question, I actually wanted to throw a little light on the demography of this place called Kundapara, which I think everybody needs to know. Kundapara is in the southern part of Karnataka. Uh, it is just around 55, km, 55 to 60 kilometers away from Bhatkal. And uh, we all should be should familiarize ourselves with Batkal, the importance of Batkal, what does Batkal have, what is the kind of practices what's happening, who is active in this particular place. Please let us not under, let us not uh, just brush this aside as a stray incident. This is nothing but a very calculative move, a very planned activity. It is not just because of uh, the elections. It could be because there is an expansion plan. And what more than the nearest available town? We all know what happened in Batkal, the Batkal brothers, the importance of it. Right. So, and what is the kind of influence? So, the idea of suddenly propping up these Dean girls, you know, the faithful girls, so called faithful girls, is nothing but portraying victimism, evoking emotions of certain community members, and then using it to defame our nation across the length and breadth of the globe is the final agenda, is what I see. So uh, there is, it's a very calculated move. And uh, if you look at it, uh, the, um, the Lao Jihad is very active in this belt and across the uh, that periphery right. uh, in moving up to Kerala. And I'm sure uh, we all know what's happening in Kerala. And uh, even the Catholic, uh, Christian community has woken up to this Lao Jihad uh, movement that is happening. And they themselves have come forward and said they have expressed their uh, concern. These are, the mat uh, these are the facts of the matter. And uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so it seems like this is an attempt at uh, psychological warfare uh, as well. Correct by employing these young girls. Uh, Abhijit ji, you know, my next question to you is, um, in the process of pushing such said psychological warfare, um, like we were discussing, whether it's uh, Shaheen Bagh or other incidents that we've witnessed in the last few years, the sad fact of the matter is that our Muslim brothers and sisters are being manipulated by their own leaders uh, uh, and, and, and politicians, their emotions are being played with. And this simply creates a polarized environment and division. These tactics were earlier started by the uh, British to divide and rule. And uh, it seems that they're continuing them even today. Uh, look, see, the thing is, Muslim polity in this country never modernized. Right, since 1857, when there was a loss of power, where, you know, 1857, correctly or wrongly, was blamed on the Muslims, who were disproportionately targeted for collective punishment after that. Uh, what happened is that you had this sort of feudal structure continue, where, uh, you know, uh, the Sunnis as a ruling class effectively are, even today, the absolute bottom of the ladder in income terms. 
You look at Shias, Ismailis, uh, uh, Khojas, uh, uh, all of them. They are somewhere near the top. They have a per capita income higher than uh, Hindus in this country. Uh, the Sunnis are at the bottom of the ladder. Why? Because you know the, uh, uh, the the kind of societal control that they experienced before being in rule was never changed. And so the, you know there was an actual prevention of modernization of that community. There were attempts like uh, Aligarh Muslim University and things like that. The issue was who was getting educated at Aligarh Muslim University? It was, you know, the children of those same feudal lords and whatever, whatever have you uh, given a patina of sophistication out there, in addition to lots of other places as well. So what happened was you essentially threw the Muslim community to the wolves. Uh, and this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, the way India functions is that we will not interfere in the internal workings of a community. So that is how the community has functioned all this while. Mm -hmm. Ever since independence, this is not new, the leaders of the community use their community as cannon fodder, all right, uh, uh, to get whatever political, that is how the political negotiation happens. So if you look at the creation of Pakistan, direct action day, what Suravardi or Jinnah or any of them did, was essentially using their own uh, uh, community as cannon fodder to get political concessions onto the table. And that has kind of been, uh, I don't know how it's changed in Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan, where I do, but that's a different matter. But in India, what's happened is violence then becomes the language of political negotiation. Before what used to happen was in the pre-social media age, if you look at the Congress rule, you will find the most horrific riots against Muslims have been during the Congress period. Because what used to happen was every time they used to feel that the leaders were getting too ahead of themselves. Uh, invariably, a, a, a communal riot would happen, which would kind of control the population. Right. What you've seen under this government is the refusal both to use state power and a refusal to use riots as a tool of policy, which means your responses are diminished, but the causal factors remain the same. So what ends up happening is you essentially have the same negotiating process happening with the provocations, but it's not allowed to flare into riots because you aren't using the normal tactics that you used to. Uh, it does happen sometimes, like we saw during the Delhi riots and things like that. But remember, those are sporadic episodes. If this government used the kind of tactics the Congress used, you would have riots like you haven't seen before in this country. Now, how do you get past this? Because understand, the Sunni community in India is double victimized. Okay, uh, one is that they're exploited by their leaders on the one hand for this kind of thing. And then the so-called secular parties victimize them again because they've been thrown to the wolves with absolutely no ability to come out of it. Yeah. So what do you do in this case? Right, the, the response has to be organic from within the community because we can't go around shoving things down other people's throats. That is not how Dharma Nirpeksh or Pans Nirpeksh works. Right. Had this been France, if you have a laissez style approach to secularism, yes, you could. But we don't. And when we do it, we're not very good at doing it either. So um, do you see this having some sort of a direct electoral impact uh, on the upcoming elections? Because, I mean, events like this, not just this in particular. They almost always have a uh, 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 connection to elections of some kind or some kind of, uh, <coughs> I suspect this would have be a much more local issue. Uh, we have to look at the interests of the local Muslim leaders in that particular region and see what's happening. But the way it's suddenly been projected onto the national stage could also, the problem is we don't know. It's definitely a political game that's being played. Who the target is and who the beneficiary is, we still don't know. Right. And uh, I, I just wanted to ask you one small follow-up. Um, you know, the newest narrative that is being set is that, you know, allow these girls to study because they come from a very conservative family where it's almost impossible to get out of the house unless they wear a hijab. So in that situation, what you're doing is to make their lives even more difficult by opposing them. No, of course, there's a lot of falsehoods uh, over there, but I just wanted to pick your brains on this. Well, look, th th there is that argument to be made because what we've seen invariably is that when you deny uh, people like this uh, a, a, a sort of a secular education, 
uh, they tend to then go back to either not being educated or, uh, you know, uh, going into radicalism. Now, the problem here is, <coughs> is there a measure where these girls, do they come from a socioeconomic background where, you know, the cost of breaking your rules actually lifts enough of them out of the kind of community ghetto mentality that exists out there, the answer is no. If you're a first world developed country where the, where the state has the monopoly on violence, where you can prevent people from being harassed and intimidated by their families, then yes, you absolutely should. I think this uh, argument applies well in France. The problem in India is you can never get these girls out of that ghetto mentality that they're in, right? Because they will always be terrorized by their families. They will always be yeah. subject to a patriarchy and things like that. So even the realistic ability of, you know, throwing them a sort of lifeline, so to say, the lifeline of education doesn't apply in this case. Right. Uh, thank you so much for putting that in perspective. Uh, uh, this is something I've been meaning to ask a lot of people. and. Uh, uh, Thank you so much for that. Uh, Kaliji, um, what I had in mind is that, you know, since we're also talking about manufactured uh, propaganda um, that's uh, going on in the, in, you know, with these events uh, taking shape, uh, does this, is this emblematic of the larger uh, Islamist intents and tactics? Uh, is there a certain pattern is what I wanted to know from you? Well, the I think the pattern is very much clear. We can uh, we can see uh, wherever it happens, uh, they 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 term it as something which is uh, their fundamental right and um, to right to profess your religion. I think a bit of uh, education and a background will be important to understand um, what hijab is and uh, is it really mandated in Quran or 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 uh, uh, in the religion. So uh, we need to possibly quickly, I need to recap on the history Please of do. Islam's beginnings. Um, you know, Muhammad uh, um, uh, Prophet uh, uh, proclaimed at the age of 40 uh, to be the Prophet. Then there was a 23 years of career, 12 years in Mecca. Mecca was a city of like maybe between five to 10,000 people, majority belonged to the same tribe uh, where the prophet was. So there was no genealogical or cultural or color or linguistic or any kind of differences between them. And uh, all the men and women looked alike. They were related to each other. So then after 10 year, uh, 12 years, he migrated. And when he migrated, uh, that was year 622, and he, he migrated with a, just a less than 100, 120 people, less than 82 families. Now, what the Muslims especially need to understand that uh, these verses of hijab, which is called, there are four verses in Quran which, which, say, which deal about this hijab thing, they were the very last commandments to be revealed in Quran. And uh, in, very interesting is that they came even after most of the Islam's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, commandments, the major commandments, like the five, uh, five daily prayers, and this is a all, all the rulings about inheritance, and even fasting in the month of Ramadan, even the zakat, even uh, you know uh, the uh, the commandments about marriage and divorce. So it shows that this was something not really uh, it doesn't matter in the polity or in the in the religious uh, um, uh, you know religion in in the religion. So what happened was that uh, the. It, 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 will, it will make it very clear to these people who, who are talking about hijab that uh, wh why it happened. It, the, the, uh, I will read the surah for you, uh, the translation which says, it was basically for the prophet's wives, not for the, all the women, uh, uh, all the faithful women. Because what happened was that 
some people in Medina, when he migrated, the culture was different They're from Mecca. They were not of the same tribe. They were not, they were different. And there were many other kind of cultures and uh, people over there. So it said, prophet, tell your wife and your daughters and the women of the believers to bring down over themselves part of their outer garments that is more suitable that they will be recognized and not be abused. This was the, this was the reason, you know. So, so uh, basically, uh, I mean, the, the prophet wanted his wife and, and right. the woman to differentiate in a way in a dress code so that they can differentiate from the other women of the society so that they will not be, uh, um, you know, uh, they should be recognized. Okay, we are different. We are not those people. Right. So this is something, and uh, now this this has been blown totally out of proportion. As uh, as Abhijit was saying that because the the Muslims have not modernized, they 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 still want to go back to the seventh century. They don't look at it that well. What were the reasons at that time? There was a there. Islam was a society that was a, that was evolving with the passage of time. It is it, it has an evolution period of twenty three years, so things came up as they were needed in the society. So it is it as a as a you know as a country or as a society when you politically organize yourself, then you in, in, enact rules and regulations as as you need it. So it, it, there is no need for such a uh, uh, such right. a hijab thing such or a you know, blowing it out of proportions but uh, as we can see is that it is all to me is a more of a politics and right. uh, you know in the garb of uh, a garb of religion and the garb of protection of the right to profess your religion nothing else it's, it's, it's right. just a totally nonsense and they need to understand that well dress there's no Islamic dress Dress is something which is which is born out of the culture and the weather and the region of the region you are. So you you cannot be. Uh, I mean, the the kind of dress even the the Arab men and women both wear, it is meant to cover their bodies fully so that uh, in the sand when in the sand dunes there is a there is a wind, it it, it should not penetrate to to the every part of your body with all the sand and then you even don't have water to uh, sufficient water to even uh, you know wash yourself right so naturally the the dress of the bengal will be different the dress of the punjab will be different and uh, uh, an eskimo in uh, uh, in 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 in, uh, in 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 north pole will be having a different kind of a dress so dress right. is something to do with nothing to do with the religion it has to do with with the with the society and the region you 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 know you Right. You wear. You cannot be doing a sewing your uh, rice uh, in the rice paddy with the shalwar uh, or, or a kurta. So you have to have a different kind of a dress. You right. cannot have a wear a turban and you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 climb a maybe a palm tree in Bengal. So, so simple common sense, which which just they are not able to understand, right. or maybe the community is not making them understand because they are not. Uh, taught to uh, uh, to respect uh, common sense or, or think rationally so that that's the basic problem thank I you mean, so much for setting this in context uh, even topographical sensibilities are not in place is what you are saying <laughs> especially yeah. when it comes to mandating um, such religious costumes uh, rashmi uh, you know when we were speaking about karnataka and since you are also a local there so you have a very good idea of what's happening on the ground you see a lot of media reports and even academic articles published where uh, Karavali Karnataka, that's the coastal Karnataka, is demonized as the Hindutva bastion of the south. And it's generally vilified that way by media houses. Um, this is supposed to be emblematic and uh, characterized by communal disharmony. Uh, you know, this could be further from the truth for especially those of us who are from that particular region or who know that particular region very well. Uh, why is there a very, uh, why is there a particular effort to push this agenda uh, that you see in the media? So 
I think for anyone who's grown up in Udupi or you know coastal Karnataka, they would know that it's 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 absolutely beautiful. The people, everything is great, and um, calling it a bastion of far right forces would just be a complete misnomer. But of course, there has been you know concerted efforts to demonize and vilify the area. More so, I feel personally, is because. that region has always been sort of the uh, last preserving hub of hinduism because we've got the ashtamatas we've got uh, we've got temples it's udupi is also called the temple town of um, india so there's there's a great push that has preserved hinduism over time and it's just a uh, um an expression of hinduism it is not an expression of suppressing or repressing anybody else to to express self but just there's been a beautiful preservation of culture over time and of hindus and hinduism and i think that gives people reason to kind of demonize and vilify that area because it's such an important place for hindus and um, i think we all know that you know vilification is step 1 in 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 a bit to uh, you know to destroy any social fabric and over time we have also seen that around the world there have been concerted efforts to vilify hindus and it's enough if you're just hindu uh, for you to just identify as hindu to be vilified so you don't need to go beyond that and i think it's the hindu identity of udupi that is the problem um that that's leading to its constant vilification right thank you so much for that aishwarya ji uh, you know i am I'm, i'm quoting the congress party here. in fact uh, shashi tharoor put out a tweet earlier this morning uh, saying that the if if the hijab is disallowed what about the sikh turban what about hindus uh, forehead mark the christians crucifix uh, so you know the congress already uh, seems to tap into the community disharmony that's there so what are your observations on this so i think uh i think when we really look at this issue this was a small local issue in kundapur uh, government high school and uh, this issue has snowballed into a national issue and who who is making this a national issue and what is the agenda behind it uh, now why was that government order passed in that school is very clear there was a law and order situation there now let's say tomorrow a law, law and order situation is created by any other religious practice and that has happened in the past uh, like sacrificing animals that has been banned by the supreme court uh, there are many religious uh, sort of activities which has been banned and uh, and the hindu majority has accepted it and lived lived with it sort of uh, and that is that that means a lot and that shows something uh, and uh, so i think as a nation when we took the constitution we always said that public health and public morality and public uh, sort of order should be kept above everything else and i mean everything else. yeah uh, of course now i'll tell you i'll give you one example uh, article 19 sets out around seven, i think six freedoms it says freedom of expression freedom of speech freedom of uh, business freedom of travel why doesn't ha- why does uh, that section not have freedom of religion because we wanted to treat freedom of religion separately and freedom freedom of religion is therefore in article 25 this is the only article which starts with a, a condition right so what is the kind of nation we wanted to build and what is the kind of nation we are building it's uh, so this and uh, unlike what abhijit ji said he said that if we do not allow women wearing hijab uh, he did he didn't say it in these very words but there was some indication saying that if we don't allow wearing uh, women wearing hijab into um, uh, educational institutions they'll be pushed into uh, maybe a madrasa or some other uh, yeah. sort of educational institution where they will not get the same standard of education but these but we need to differentiate that case from this case these 6 to 7 uh, underage girls did not wear hijab earlier as rashmi said there are images of them not wearing hijab so this is definitely this is this is a political um, sort of act uh, by some local organizations we all know the names of these local organizations uh, 
so this needs to be differentiated so when a court will look at it they will differentiate it yeah, and this is already very clear yeah and in fact uh, the left and the congress party uh, says that those who are opposing the hijab are coming in the way of girls education and spoiling their future uh, which we discussed earlier and in fact Ra- rahul gandhi added uh, today morning that you know ma saraswati gives knowledge to all and she doesn't differentiate but uh, my question is uh, and maybe jerome ji can uh, step in on this uh, could there not be a greater insult to ma saraswati than to manufacture these events and prevent such girls from getting further education um i will answer both your questions because your early question was not answered but i will answer it in brief uh, since you brought in the sashi tarur's uh, tweet uh, sashi tarur should know that uh, and i'm sure he knows very well that uh, in any educational institution especially if it's a christian institution where i have studied all my life uh, where uh, the institutions were run by the religious the priests and the nuns uh, it was very strict order uh, i even know even now that uh, christian institutions where girls come with hijab they remove the hijab outside the school they and pack it up and then get into the school that is one thing uh, in my days i remember uh, and i'm sure even now if somebody is wearing a cross a christian is wearing a cross okay and if the religious if the if the school tells them to put the cross inside the students will obediently put the cross inside they will not stand up for a protest uh, i think so, shashi tarur is a is a wily wolf he uh, he can twist and uh, turn uh, the words and languages the way he wants to and use certain communities to its advantage uh the christian uh, mentality is very clear they will never stand out against it if anything is spoken uh, in terms of hiding their own religious identity especially if it is displaying a cross uh, i remember in my earlier school days uh, 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 and uh, also during my college days uh, the priests especially were very strict in terms of uh, uh, what do you call that displaying our uh, religious uh, attire Uh, especially uh, i remember hindus uh, they cannot wear the rudrakshis they would say please remove the rudrakshi and they were very conveniently the boys used and the girls used to remove, boys used to remove it uh, so so there was lot of uh, so i don't understand how uh, the educational context has changed now and especially in a government run school that's one thing second thing is this uh, i think we should uh, we should stop uh, 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 listening or uh, even hearing to mr rahul gandhi because one thing is that he is still not come of age and uh, uh, he uh, he uh, his uh, inclinations towards uh, his religion uh, his religion which we do not know which religion he belongs to uh, keeps shifting and uh, thing so there is a very nice verse in the bible which says that even the devil can can quote the bible so i think uh, we should just dismiss it uh, mr rahul gandhi's uh, statement and uh, proceed further and i hope uh, the judiciary stands up uh, for the interests of this nation uh, because i am very very worried about uh, what the judiciary is go- how the judiciary is going to take it up because yeah. some very disturbing judgments in the last uh, few year few months and few years so i hope some uh, this thing comes out uh, very clean otherwise you will have sir, sir, the sikh community bringing in daggers into the school okay and uh, you will have hindus wearing panches and i'm sure they'll also bring in bells they will say this is this muhurta this is that muhurta and i will have to do my prayers uh, so it's not going to be very convenient uh, so i only hope that the judgment is fair and and stands on the secular fabric of the nation thank you so much uh, abhijit ji uh, you know since this is a particular region that uh, has historically exhibited a lot of resistance to islamic invasions uh, from the west because of its uh, geographical uh, location you know i think uh, the newer fact that we are seeing is that even teenagers are being accustomed to these uh, politics of the binaries that we see uh, today right whereas wherein young hindu girls are wearing saffron shawls and they have probably not done that uh, or worn that to college before so this is a definitely a new development now adding on to everything what has been discussed today so going forward especially if uh, you know reforms within the muslim society have not been very successful in the last 
200 and uh, 200 300 years in india now there is a political atmosphere dominated by the so called hindutva right wing so under them will it be still further possible so what is the way forward is what i want to ask and this answer can be purely philosophical as well well look it isn't a philosophical uh, answer it's actually a very practical one the answer is industrialization right so you look at say iran or turkey people forget this but you know iran up to 1979 had a higher per capita income than taiwan in south korea uh, and they were modernizing very, very rapidly. And in that sense, you know, the uh, so-called Islamic revolution there was the, uh, 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 it was unfortunate timing because it had to do with the sudden drop in petrol prices uh, and the economic uh, 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 crises that came out because of the balance of payments combined with Ayatollah Khomeini and his ilk, you know, uh, politicizing the whole thing. And that was the revenge of a class that was being sidelined by the people. And to be fair, what was happening in Iran is in cities like, say, Isfahan or Tehran or Mashhad, they were extremely uh, uh, progressive and forward looking. But in other places like Shiraz or Qum or uh, Karman, uh, they were not. Uh, where, you know, the, uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the hold of the imams on the uh, people was still quite uh, 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 strong. Uh, now, you look at other places where uh, this happened. In Turkey, it happened without consensus. And what happened in that process was that they were modernizing. I mean, you go if you remember Turkey 15, 20 years back, even during the first term of Erdogan, they were a phenomenally uh, you know, progressive uh, 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 people. Uh, the problem was in Anatolia, in the deep eastern parts of that uh, uh, country, where no development had happened, that is where you know, Erdogan's party, the AKP, gets yeah. all its votes and then captures everything else. Right. Because, you know, when you don't have development, when you don't have things to worry about, like in terms of, uh, you know, where I'm going to go for the next holiday and things, uh, you then regress back to religion and, you know, religious or not just religion, religious orthodoxy. Okay. Now, you look at what has happened in uh, the uh, Emirates and Saudi Arabia. You look at where Dubai and Abu Dhabi are today. They've gotten there slowly, 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 slowly through uh, uh, industrial development. Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing. I, I pray, you know, I, I am an atheist, but I pray five times a day for Mohammed bin Salman because, you know, I, I, I hope he succeeds and does what uh, 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 Sheikh bin Zayed has done in uh, the UAE. But I uh, sometimes fear he's probably going too fast. Because even in the UAE, if you look, in the UAE, it has the same dynamic as Iran and Turkey, where one section is more backward and one section is not. If you remember 20 years back, all the cricket games were played in Sharjah and they all used to be sipping champagne in public. Today, Sharjah has a Sharia law. Whereas Dubai and Abu Dhabi have gone ahead, Sharjah has actually regressed back in time. Right. right? Uh, why? Because it, it, it simply hasn't moved economically. They're in complete stasis. Uh, Brunei has gone back. It's implemented Sharia now. Why? Because the king is kind of losing his, uh, uh, well, mind, uh, to put it, to not put too fine a point on it. So the answer to going forward is actually quite simple. It's economic progress. Okay. Economic progress, essentially, you look at it historically. Uh, economics an improvement in living standards and uh, uh, giving people meaningful employment has always reduced the power of feudal forces, be they barons or lords in Europe or imams and muezzins in uh, other parts of the world. Yeah. It has always reduced and moved you towards, a, if not a post-religious society, then definitely a society that takes religion very easily. It finds a path of least resistance. In fact, uh, this is probably one of the reasons why the BJP also won a lot of uh, Muslim votes in 2019 because of moves like uh, triple talaq and things like that, right? Absolutely. So, uh, look, that's only one part of it. My fear with the BJP mm -hmm. is that they do things, they think, uh, you know, uh, think of this as an operation. Even a simple operation like appendicitis, imagine I'm going for uh, an appendicite, uh, an appendectomy. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't just depend on the doctor going in with the scalpel and taking out my appendix. Uh, 
The anesthetist has to get it right. The diagnosis has to be right. God knows if there's a liver problem that's been diagnosed to my appendix. Uh, uh, the area has to be perfectly sterilized. The operation room has to be sterilized. When I'm under anesthesia, is my oxygen going in correctly? Otherwise, I'll still die. The problem is the BJP has this siloized approach that they'll only take the scalpel. They won't even apply disinfectant or anything. They will go in with the scalpel, open you up without anesthesia, oxygen, anything like that, and take out your appendix. So who is the solutions? <laughs> yeah. So well, the solutions are always a system of systems. Everything has to work together. Otherwise, it does not work. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.